Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be going over chain termination or Sanger DNA sequencing. So what is Sanger sequencing? Well it's a method of DNA sequencing developed by Applied Biosystems in 1977 and it's named after the scientist who developed it, Frederick Sanger. It's still used widely today even though we have next-gen sequencing methods at our disposal. That's because we know that Sanger sequencing works. So even though these next-gen methods are quicker, more effective, and uh, have a lower cost per base, we can use Sanger sequencing to verify those results. Uh, it's also better when uh, using it for smaller scale applications, since it would be impractical to use some of those next-gen methods. So what are the materials needed for the reaction? Well, first we need a DNA sample, and you're going to hear me use the, the term template interchangeably with DNA sample in a sequence, and that's the sequence that we actually want to determine the nucleotide sequence for. Now, Sanger sequencing relies on some concepts from DNA replication. And so, to complete the reaction, we're going to need DNA polymerase. And an example of that would be uh, TAC polymerase, with the TAC standing for Thermus aquaticus, the organism that it's sourced from. Uh, because polymerase cannot just uh, replicate um, some strand of DNA from scratch and need something to work off of, we're also going to need DNA primers, uh, around 20 base pairs long. And we're also going to need DNTPs that the polymerase can use to extend the primer and to copy the DNA sample. In the mix, we're also going to have DDNTPs, which are very similar to DNTPs, and these are going to be either radio labeled with radioactive phosphorus or dyed with some fluorescent dye. So, what's the difference between a DNTP and a DDNTP? Well, DDNTP stands for dideoxynucleotide triphosphate. And if you recall the difference between DNTPs um, and the, the nucleotides used in RNA synthesis, uh, you'll remember that uh, RNA has uh, something in the backbone called ribose, and DNA has deoxyribose. And the difference is that deoxyribose has one less oxygen than ribose, and that's because deoxyribose is missing the oxygen at the 2' prime position. Now, dideoxyribose, which is the sugar in dideoxynucleotides, DDNTPs, they're missing both the oxygens, hence the prefix dideoxy, missing both oxygens at the 2' prime and the 3' prime carbon. So the difference is just one oxygen atom. And it may seem insignificant right now, but it's actually going to be very important later on uh, when the reaction is being conducted. The first step of the process in Sanger sequencing is primer binding. So if you recall from a couple of slides back, primers are oligonucleotides around 20 bases long. And once they anneal to the template strand, polymerase can start doing, um, can start adding nucleotides and copying the com copying the template uh, and creating the complement to that template sequence. So then normal elongation occurs, and this is where polymerase adds DNTPs to uh, to the primer, thus copying the template and creating the complement to that strand, uh, as it would in normal DNA replication. But when the polymerase adds the DDNTP, the reaction stops. This is because the polymerase has to recognize the, the substrate, and it can't recognize it as a substrate and continue the reaction because DDNTPs aren't the same as DNTPs. So it says this isn't DNA because DDNTPs lack that 3' prime oxygen um, that's in the backbone, that's in the sugar. And so it can't keep adding because the DDNTP was added to the sequence. Now I'm going to go over how we would collect data if we were using uh, radio-labeled DDNTPs uh, with radioactive phosphorus attached. So what you have to do first is separate it or separate the uh, the materials into four separate reactions. And these are going to happen simultaneously. And the only difference between these reactions is the DDNTP added. So one would have um, a dideoxynucleotide version of adenine, another one would have one of thymine, another one with guanine, and the final with cytosine. Every single reaction is going to have the template DNA, uh, the amplified template DNA, primers, polymerase, and normal DNTPs. The only difference is the DDNTP that was added. So here I'm going to show you an example reaction to demonstrate this process. Uh, up in the title, I've put a sample sequence, A, G, C, G, A, T, T, C. So the corresponding sequence that would be created from the polymerase reaction would be TCGCTAAG. 
And so here I've shown what would happen in each of the four reactions. Uh, there's a different, there's a probability that the sequence can end at any of the DDNTPs, or that a normal DNT could, could be added even though the DDN, the corresponding DDNTP is present in that reaction mix. And so you can see that here in the top left box for DDATP, uh, the two possible um, two possible combinations with DDATP would be um, ending at the first adenine and ending at the second adenine. Same thing happens with the DDTTP reaction, where um, it can end at either the first T or the second T. And this happens in each of the four reactions, where you have sequences that are ending uh, with the corresponding DDNTP for every single uh, for every single incidence of that base. So for every uh, G that's in the that's in the corresponding sequence, um, there's going to be uh, there's going to be strands, fragments that end with a DDNTP version of guanine. And so now you have all of these fragments of different lengths. And these fragments of different lengths, when lined up, can give you the result. The result should be, as I said in the previous slide, TCGCTAAG. And so here you can see, if we line up all of our resulting DDNTP sequences, we have that sequence. Here, TCGCTAAG is lined up, uh, diagonally going down, and that's because each of, these have, each of these fragments are of different lengths. So how would we get this data for radio-labeled radio DDNTPs? Well, you would run four gels simultaneously for the same amount of time, and you would stop it once the bands, um, once the bands are visible and evenly spaced. And so now you can tell if a fragment, the shortest fragment here in this case, ends with adenine. And so that means that the first base would be adenine. Then the second base um, ends, with ends with a DDNTP version of thymine, so you know that the second base is thymine. And so on and so forth. And this process would just keep continuing. Um, and so that way, because the fragments are of different lengths and they each end in a different DDNTP, you can tell what the sequence is. So what about reactions involving fluorescent dyes? Well, the reaction and the DDNTP termination still occur, but there's only one reaction. So there's just one reaction mix, and all of the DDNTPs are added to that one reaction mix. So the entire reaction takes place at once. So here I have a template defined, and the template is going to be A, G, C, G, A, T, T, C, the same as the previous template. But the difference now is that you're going to run the entire result through a single gel. And you're going to have different fragments that end with different DDNTPs. And because they're all of different lengths, they're going to separate according to their length, in order from shortest to smallest. Then a laser is going to activate the gels, or rather the, the fluorescent dyes inside the DNA, inside the gel. And as you go along the sequence, a different color is going to be activated for a different base. And a detector is going to pick up which dye color is being fluoresced. And so that's how you could tell it would go along, um, and different lengths would correspond to different numbers, uh, different indexes inside of that uh, nucleotide sequence. And so with this laser and this detector, you can determine what the sequence is. And this data is converted by the sequencing machine into something called a chromatogram. And you also hear it called an electropherogram, but typically it's called a chromatogram or a waveform. And these files contain the DNA, the, tra the trace data. And uh, this is just an example of a chromatogram showing uh, bases from around 100 to 150 of some sequence.